heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital. The war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom. The police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur. The creator. The producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello, and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews. I'm here on the line with Vicki Gould. Are you there, Vicki? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Glad to have you here. Let me do a quick introduction for people who don't know who you are. You are a uh, book coach and content marketing strategist. You use your uh, holistic strategy and your storytelling superpowers, which I'll talk a little bit more about today, to help your clients write best-selling books that share their stories impactfully, grow their following, turn their readers into clients, increase their income, and they have worldwide impact. Um, you said this year that you've uh, got 10 international best-selling books yourself, yep. um, which is quite impressive. And you been featured on Entrepreneur, TEDx, um, Huff, Huff Post, Thrive Global, YFF Magazine, and several other places. So, all over the list. so why don't we start here? And basically, what is it that you're known for that uh, that people come to you for? Yeah, well, most people come to me because they want to become bestsellers. Um, they want to write a book for their business, and they want to get more credibility and expert status. Awesome. So you and you said you've helped over a hundred people become bestsellers. Uh, nearly a hundred. We're getting close to a hundred now. Um, and you know, the thing that that is a little bit different is that we work with the book in the in the idea of okay, now I've got this book. Now what? What should I do with the book to actually grow my business and um, leverage it for more opportunities? Awesome. So you actually take them beyond just the book and actually how to how to drive that in the client yeah. relationships and maybe speaking deals and things like that. Yeah. I have a tagline. It says from blank page to bestseller and beyond, you know, like, like Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> nice. So let's start with your, uh, your origin story then, right? Every hero has an origin story. Where did you sort of realize that maybe you were different? Maybe you had superpowers that you could help people, you know, write and do something, you know, valuable like that. How did that story start for you? Yeah, well, back in 2009, I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. And if you don't know much about it, it's kind of like a conglomerate of other things. It's easier to describe like that. And it's misdiagnosed for a lot. So it's kind of like having MS, lupus, Alzheimer, dementia, fibro, chronic fatigue, vertigo, and everything all wrapped up in one. And I... The, the, yeah, I, I remember the day the doctor, he just kind of looked at me and goes, you know what, Vicki, you have the body of an 80 year old, you're going to have to learn to accept it. And this is just the way the rest of your life is going to be. It was, it was like a suck it up kind of little thing that he was trying to tell me. And I think it was because I kept telling him, well, let's try this or let's try that, you know, and he was trying to tell me, look, you're going to have to accept this. And I remember calling my sister afterwards and saying, you know what, if this disease takes me, you have got to promise me that you're going to tell my kids what I wanted for them. You're going to have to tell my kids what I, what I used to do, who I really was, because I was spending 16 to 18 hours in bed. And so to my kids, I was like just this woman who slept all the time that couldn't go to their school parties, that couldn't participate anymore, that couldn't even barely make dinner. And I remember just, you know, spending my nights crying on the bathroom floor because I didn't want to wake up my husband. I didn't want people to know how I really felt. But inside what was really going on was I was contemplating how to take my life because it was so painful for me to watch everything just flashing by me. It wasn't even flashing. It was more like slow-mo. Um, you know, and I had all these high hopes of what I had wanted to do with my life. I think we're really good at telling ourselves, oh, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. You know, after the kids have grown up, after this, after that. And I realized at that point that 
all those times that I said, do it later, or I'll get to traveling, or I'll get to doing something, that that time may never come. But the thing was that I really didn't want to die. I really just wanted to be able to live life and to not struggle anymore and not be in pain and not have to, you know, sleep all day long because I felt like I was sleeping my life away. You know, my little boy would come to me and he'd be like, Mama, can you go to my school party? And I would just watch his eyes, you know, the big <laughs> eyes and the puffy cheeks that you want to squeeze. And I'm like, you know, he's, he's, he's like, can you come to my party? I'm like, I, I can't do it. I'm just not up to it. And I just felt like such a failure. I felt like I was, you know, draining the family's finances and all that stuff. But somewhere deep inside me said, you know what? I want to be around for my future grandchildren. I want to be around to experience things. Like it, it to me didn't seem right that the doctor could tell me what was going to happen. So I started reading other books about people who had overcome chronic illnesses, you know, like Crohn's disease or even like cancer, where they were told they were terminal or there was no hope and just, you know, suck it up like I had been told. And I realized that through those stories that there was hope for me, that I could figure something out that the doctor doesn't get to say because there's no set protocol for Lyme. There's no cure. They don't really know how to deal with it. So if they don't know, how can they really tell me that I have to suck it up? So I became a master herbalist at that time because I started just researching all these herbs to try and make myself better. And through that process and then through sharing my struggles and sharing what I was doing, other people started coming to me too. So I ended up being a wellness coach after that. I wrote my first book and people started saying, well, how are, how are you doing this? How are you attracting your clients? How are you um, creating this following? And what was happening was, um, you know, it was a power of story. And what I realized at that time was so many other people have those stories of perseverance, of tenacity, of digging down into, you know, the recesses of their strength to get out of their struggles, to do something different for their lives. And I knew that those stories had to be told because all those times when we kind of like scream out, maybe internally scream out, why me? Those are the stories that help other people. Like if other people hadn't shared how they had overcome their chronic illnesses or their terminal diseases, I wouldn't have realized that I could do the same for me. So for me, storytelling is so important because it not just gives people hope and possibility, it also shares with them that they're not alone that it's been done before, you know, and they don't have to settle for life being the way that it is, that they can go out and create what they want. And that's why, you know, now it's just it's such an honor and blessing for me to have the trickle effect. Tri <laughs> I just said that wrong. <laughs> The effect where, you know, um, the ripple effect where everybody who's writing their books, you know, they're helping other people, which means I was part of that. And I just feel like stories, it's the connection and the change that we can create um, purely by sharing what we've been through. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's uh, it's really fascinating that uh, that um, stories are so powerful. Like one of the things I like to talk about is that we're a story born people, right? And you build relationships through stories, right? So your um, a friend is someone who, you know, you know their name and you know their story. And a best friend is someone who you've shared so many stories with that the only way to make, you know, to continue a relationship is to make new stories together. Right? Right. And, and stories are really, it's what, it's what makes us who we are. And in your case, you know, um, uh, and a lot of people's cases, it's other people's stories that really drive us to to make changes and improve our lives and change things. So yeah, it's it's really yes. cool. So I'm going to talk. You know, you mentioned in your in your bio, your intro, that your superpower is storytelling, mm -hmm. right? So I generally ask people what their superpower is, but since we've already established your superpower is storytelling, yeah. How did you develop that superpower? Was it something that you think you were born with or something that you had to work on and create? And, you know, like how, how does that sort of come, up, come to be? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you, you know, I have always been a talkative person and I've always been fairly expressive when I talk. Um, I like to think I'm entertaining. <laughs> um, and 
I never really thought that this was what I was going to end up doing. Like if you ask my friends, my family, you know, they'd be like, what is it that you do? And people pay you for that? Like they're kind of surprised um, because I have a degree in actuarial math. So it's like one side of the brain, the other side of the brain. Um, and I think I just had a knack for it. Um, I love speaking. I used to be in theater. I used to write poetry, you know, all of that stuff. And it wasn't until I realized how magnetic the stories were that I was telling because, you know, people were asking me. and I didn't realize what I was doing at the time. And one of my coaches calls that your unconscious competencies, the things that you do yeah. that are just natural, right? And then when people yeah. ask you about it, yeah, when people ask you about it, you kind of go, huh, let me see if I can break that down for you and go back and think about how I do that because I was just doing it. Yeah, I tell people that uh, if you ever say to yourself, someone asks you something, you say, oh, it's easy. You just do fill in the blank, yeah. right? If you ever say, that's a trigger phrase. If you ever say, oh, that's easy, that's something that you have unconscious confidence about, right? Yeah. And things that you're really good at. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are your, where you can really value for other people. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really interesting that uh, that it's something you sort of, you know you had some inward talent, but you uh, you um, helped drive you know like actually creating that um, mm -hmm. as a as a superpower. And it's actually I think probably one of the more powerful ones, right? Is getting because everything we do is about storytelling, right? Whether it's ads or writing copy or getting a book or getting someone to say yes to you the speaking yeah. gig or someone buy from you, it's all storytelling um, and we master at it mm -hmm. then you can it's it's one of those like universally applicable skills that, that you can never sort of be taken down so to speak doesn't matter what happens in the economy someone's always going to need help telling right. stories right you know especially right? you have a, it, these days they need to stand out and people choose to work with certain people because they're buying an experience. So they kind of, these days, it feels like more and more that consumers, clients, whatever you want to call them, you know, that they really want to know that backstory. They really want to know who you actually are there. And part of it's like a little test, I think too, to make sure you're a real person. <laughs> Cause it used to be, I think that so many at one time were just putting out their perfect self right? Here's all the things I've done. Here are all these awesome, just be like me. And I think now it's more like a, yeah, I've done these awesome things, but guess what? There was a time in my life that I really sucked at some things <laughs> and times were really bad. And I was able to get out of that. And then all of a sudden people go, oh, that's where I am now. Or wow, they could really relate to me or I can relate to them. And that's what makes getting true. clients easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to you have to learn how to tell your your heroes journey, can see themselves, yeah. and 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 then go on their own, you know, journey, so to speak, and yep. um, and sort of model that, which is mm -hmm. really um, cool. So the other side of a superpower is, of course, your fatal flaw, right? So when you have got into um, got into this storytelling thing, what would you say your fatal flaw in building this storytelling business has been? And more importantly, how have you worked to overcome that or um, to, to continue to grow your business? <laughs> I think I would have to answer that with some of the same fatal flaws I think a lot of other entrepreneurs make. They're impatient um, and they jump a little bit from thing to thing. And they're like, oh, maybe this will work. Oh, maybe that'll work. Because as much as I am really, you know, analytical in the mass, I'm also really creative. And so I would come up with things, go, oh, I want to try that, or that sounds really good. Or I'd see somebody do something and I, oh, I want to try that too. And then I'd be really impatient about, okay, where are all the clients? Where are all the followers? Where, like, why is this not happening just like that? Because even the other day I saw this Facebook ad and it was like, get to six figures in 90 days. And I was like, oh, can we stop doing that, please? Because the reality is, it's like, big time and effort. yes. And who are they talking to? Are they talking to somebody who is already making five thousand or six thousand a month, or are they talking to a newbie? Like, there has to be context in it, and usually that context isn't there, and it kind of drives me a little crazy. So, I would say for me, just like a lot of other entrepreneurs, there's a little shiny object syndrome that kind of like pulled me away here and there. Um, and also being so impatient. I just, I just really wanted things to happen. And, and also I think 
for me, having felt like I had lost my life, I felt like I was also trying to make up for time. And then I think, oh, but what if I were to get sick again? Yeah, I really want to happen really. fast. Yeah, so what what do you think the uh, the the solution is for people who might be struggling with impatience or shiny object syndrome? And how can they sort of deal with that? And yeah, really push well, forward for, towards their goals? Yeah, um, well, two things. You know, when we're impatient, sometimes it's because we set expectations that are unreasonable because we just don't realize what it takes. A lot of times when we do something the first time, who knows, right? And then we might flub it up and have to try it again. So we don't know really how long it's going to take. Um, so I think some of it is a, a matter of knowing what steps and how long that's going to actually take you to do. So that helps with the impatience. I think we're impatient because we think it's supposed to happen a certain way. And then the way that it actually happens is usually a little bit different, <laughs> you know? Um, and then in terms of shiny object syndrome, I think it's so easy to get in that trap, especially when you're new and you're not getting as many clients as you want, because then you're like, well, gosh, if I try this or gosh, if I try that, rather than saying to ourselves, you know what, I got to try this one thing and this one message and really hit this home and really get good at this one message and this one audience and this one thing, right, for the next 90 days. And then let's reevaluate whether or not it works. We're so fast to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Yeah, I think the the I think those both really tie together the impatience and the shiny object syndrome, right? We get impatient so then we throw everything out, we move to something else, and then we get impatient, we throw it out, and it's a cycle that we repeat. And mm -hmm. but, um, one of the things that I I've I found endlessly fascinating just in my own career and watching people succeed is we tend to think too short term, right? Everyone tells you you need to have weekly goals and you know and and monthly goals and six yeah. month goals and year long goals or whatever, and then they stop. Right? The reality is is and I've seen this time and time again that we vastly overestimate what we can accomplish in a year, mm -hmm. and we vastly underestimate what we can accomplish in ten. Right. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you take ten years and you make a little bit of progress every day you go from being a newbie to being world class. Like yeah. nobody can touch you in your face. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't happen in a year. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Right. You're mm -hmm. you're not going to become world class from newbie status in a year. Right? It's all this, you know, hit six figures in six months kind of thing. Sure you can do that, but you know, you probably don't know your business real well. Right. And you can lose it just as quick. Right? Yeah. But when you actually put the time and effort and the skill and everything into it and have the patience and really grow something you can become a master over time mm -hmm. um, and that's um anyways i think that's it's a it's an important discussion an important thing like you mentioned like knowing what to expect and i think mm -hmm. if we can help reset people's expectations that business is not a super quick fast easy thing it's going to take time and effort and, and you know it's like i i'm not saying it in a way that i want to like crush anybody's great aspirations and dreams because we can shorten the timeline, right, by being smart, right, and taking actions and taking the right actions. And and there's a lot to be said about that as well, Absolutely. shortening the time frame and, you know, getting mentors and coaches that will help you shorten that time frame so that you don't have to, you know, fall down and pick yourself up as many times <laughs> as they did. And so getting somebody who's been there before can shorten that timeline. And it's not impossible for some of the things. It's just like, I just, it, it like I said, it grates my nerves sometimes when people come into the business and they're like, oh, well, I saw so-and-so and this and that and whatever. I'm going to hit a million dollars in the next year. Well, how much did you make last year? 20 grand? Well, <laughs> you know, it's a little more difficult. Yeah. And, and like a lot of times you see, um, you see the front end, right? You see what they want you to see. You don't see, you know, we went from zero to six figures in six right. months. We right. also had a staff with 20 people, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and right. Uh, and, you know, maybe you can do that when you have a staff like that. Or, you know, we also had maybe we had venture capital funding. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a big difference between someone who's got a staff and venture capital versus someone who's shoestring, shoestringing it as a solopreneur. And how Absolutely. long it takes to do those things. And that's what, like to your point. The context is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where are you? What kind of skill sets do you have? Like, you know, if you're talking, you know, 
am I starting with a, a whole bedrock of skill sets that I can bring to bear on whatever it is I'm trying to do? Or am I completely new and learning a new, a new set of skills that I didn't have before? Mm-hmm. Um, and time's going to play into all those things. Mm-hmm. What I'm going to talk about next is your common enemy, right? So the way I like to think about this is when you take a new client on and they come to you and you know, you're going to help them tell their story and get their book written. What yeah. is the thing that you have to fight against with them, their mindsets, things like that, yep. that you wish you could just wave a magic wand and remove that from them so that they, they could make massive leaps, leaps with you. What would you think that common enemy is? The judgment and the confidence. You know, the, the what if I put my story out there and people think it's stupid? What if I write this book and I sound dumb? What if people think it's not interesting or maybe it's not as helpful as I think it will be? Or what if it's so bad nobody wants to ever buy it? You know, that, that's used, that usually comes up and then a little bit around like the confidence of a bestseller. You really have to own that title if you want to leverage and monetize your book. Um, that's just part of it, right? And some people will be like, oh, I feel like it's really bragging if I put it under my email signature or whatever. I'm like, you're not bragging. It's a fact. You have a best-selling book. It's, it's not a brag. It's a fact. You know? um, and I think sometimes they're like, gosh, am I enough? Because that's pretty universal, right? A lot of these things are pretty universal. And I always say books and business kind of parallel themselves. So whatever is showing up for you in business is going to show up for your book. If you're running around trying to figure out the topic and the message and your audience for your business, yeah. you're doing the same thing in your book. If you're worried about if you're enough in your business, maybe I need to go out and get more credentials. Maybe I need to get more education. Maybe I blah, 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 right? Um, that's going to be the same thing that happens when you're writing your book. And that fear of judgment and worthiness and enoughness, I think, shows up too many places in our lives. So when you bring on a new client and you know that you're going to have to deal with that, what are some of the tactics and strategies you, you, you use to help your clients overcome that and know that their story is good? And, yeah. You know, like one of the things I've, I've had the discussion a number of times with clients and like even with my wife, she's like, I don't know why I would do that and I would pay for it. And or like, you know, so-and-so is not going to like it. I'm like, the person who doesn't like it is not your customer. Exactly. Right? That's generally the discussion we have. There's, there's generally people who do, but like, how, how, do you, how do you handle that? How do you help people? Yeah, I love, that? That you, I love that you said that because, you know, good marketing attracts and repels, right? There are going to be some people who really hate it. And the very first book that I wrote, and that's there, a thing. actually an Amazon review that like, oh, stabbed me in the heart. It basically is like, this is a rambling of just somebody who doesn't know what she's talking about. And of course, you know what we do? We take that one person's comment and it just overshadows any good thing that anybody could have possibly said. There are all these other reviews and people were talking to me like, oh my gosh, this was so helpful to me. You really laid it out step by step. Now I understand what I need to do. And now I can um, get out of this or that, right? And <laughs> it's it's just human nature i think we just end up doing that but what i tell people is that you know most of them will say if this helps just one person it's worth it you know this is a common thing my clients will say they're very heart centered people i'm like yeah and we can take a stand for the and and say if it helps one ple- person then it's worth it and we're going to go out and help thousands and millions you know with this book The thing about it is, you know, it's another thing with um, knowing what's going to happen in the future and and being real about what's going to happen is you're going to have haters. You're going to have people that don't like you. Those people weren't necessarily meant to be in your circle. They weren't meant to necessarily read your book. Your book wasn't written for them. It was written for the other people. And so you really have to take into consideration, does it matter more to you, the people that you helped or your own ego and comfortness, right? And sometimes it'll keep people from even putting out the book that they have these fears. So I talked to them about um, how much impact they can have and letting go of what those things mean to them and concentrating more on how they're going to benefit the client. And when it starts to mean more to them to make that impact, then they care less about their own, I'm going to say hurts, right? That come about from those things that might happen. And the fact of the matter is everybody's going to have a bad review somewhere out there, whether it's public or private, 
written or spoken, somebody's not going to like you. Like somebody out there doesn't like me. Like, oh, how could that possibly be? Right. <laughs> we like to think we're the center of the universe sometimes, but yeah, you know, there's always going to be someone who doesn't like you. I always like to, you know, if you're not pissing at least one person off, you're not doing something right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't, you know, so, it's okay to be hurt by it. Right. Just sit in that for a second, but then really realize that it doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I want to, uh, I want to move to the other side of that, right. And talk a little bit about your driving force and right? mm-hmm. this is what you fight for. So if you're fighting against that judgment and fighting against that, you know, feeling not being worthy or not having whatever, what is it that you're fighting for that, you know, like Spider-Man fights to save New York, Batman fights to save Gotham, Google fights to index the world's information. What is it that you, Vicky, what are you fighting for when you're helping your clients? I am fighting for them to actually have a voice in the world. Um, you know, their story is just so, so very important to help the people that they need to help or were called to help or were put on this earth to help, however you want to say it. And when we shirk away and hide in the corner or don't be visible, we can't make the impact that we want. So it's like this, these two things that are, like you're saying, right, they're fighting against each other. On the one hand, they want to make this huge impact. They know that they have something. On the other hand, they want to go crawl in the corner and hide. And the two things don't go together. So the thing that they really need to know is that, you know, when you put yourself out there, the more that you put yourself out there and the more real and honest you are when you put yourself out there, the more people appreciate it, the more it, it's surprising, you know, people come back to their surprise. It's funny how surprised they are that, oh my gosh, my story was actually widely accepted. And people really came up to me like after I spoke or after they read this part of the book, I got feedback that, oh my gosh, how much that helped. And once they start getting that feedback, they realize that, you know, that thing that they were really called to share is as important as it felt to them. Because if you have that urge to write a book, it's not going to go away. Yeah, there's something, a story clawing to get out, and it's going to find a way to get out. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to talk a little bit about your tools, right? Yeah. So um, every hero has their tool belt. You know, Thor has his big magical hammer. Our, you know, police officers have that cool little belt with all the gizmos on it, right? Um, what are some of the tools that you use either to help write books or to help your clients get their stories out of them? What are some of the uh, the the like, I don't know, physical or digital tools that you use to make your work a reality? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. So it's funny because one of the things that I'm told is that I have a way of breaking things down step by step and making something that looks overwhelming and hard seem a lot easier. And I think I started doing that. I I would have to say that's another superpower. (laughs) I think I started doing that only because I would feel overwhelmed with big projects, right? And then I'd be like, okay, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So I would have to break it down into smaller pieces so that I didn't feel like, oh, I got to do this whole thing all at once. I'm not going to be able to do this. But when you break things up into smaller pieces, then it really works for you. And I have this way of like making acronyms for things. (laughs) So like how you share your story in a book, the acronym is actually, it's funny. It actually is funny how well it's worked out because there are four steps to that in a written way. And so B-O-O-K actually worked really well. And then when they share their story on stage, it's actually a five-step process. And lo and behold, stage is a five-letter word. (laughs) And um, then I have something with like networking that I call ABC. And then something for like, if you're putting your story out and you want to make engaging posts on social media or in live streams or whatever, um, it's called social CTA. So it's six steps, S-O-C-I-A-L, and then CTAs are called to action. So um, I tend to like to do that. <laughs> and when I get yeah, something I just right, I'm right. like, oh, magic. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. It's, uh, it's one of my, uh, my powers. Similar thing is like, I, I really, I call it, uh, 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 what did I, I have a, Ling- linguistic programming essentially right because you're you're using language to help 
program people so they can understand your message. Yeah. And um, I love doing that. So like all of the things that I teach and I work with clients, put, like put put things into uh, um, into things that people can remember, right? So like I have my sales process that actually I use the word oh, wow. sell. I call it the sell framework, S-E-L-L. Mm. Um, and I have my alchemy framework, digital alchemy, and this goes through A-L-C-H-E-M-Y. So I do the same kind of thing, make acronyms and yeah. um, I help tell people stories that way. Because I think it helps people remember what is uh what's being done um, yeah. so it does. um anyways yeah it's super helpful the new show will be right back are you tired of trying to write webinars that don't consistently convert how would you like to have a webinar that effortlessly created sales in your online business you can introducing the webinar alchemy workshop webinar alchemy workshop is an online masterclass that will help you write incredibly persuasive webinars for your online courses quickly and easily Using what you learn in this class, you can build a webinar that educates your entire audience while still creating sales. For a limited time, you can purchase this masterclass for only $7, and you'll get the exact framework I've personally used to help my clients sell more than a million dollars worth of online coaching and training just over the last year. Simply text the word ALCHEMY, A-L-C-H-E-M-Y, to 444-999, and I'll send you all the details. The music is by Purple Planet Music. Visit www.purple-planet.com. So I want to talk a little bit about um, your own personal heroes, right? So, um, you know, in we talk, you know, Frodo has Ganfall, Luke had Obi-Wan, Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad. Who were some of your heroes? Um, were they real life mentors? Were they speakers or authors? Were they people who peers who were just years ahead of you? And how important were they to what you've done so far? Wow. Um, heroes. You know, it, it's, it's interesting because... Um, a few people come to mind. I have a, a, a friend that passed away from Lyme disease, and I would say she was one of my heroes. Um, they had given her a lot of antibiotics, um, but she was just such a trooper and always smiling and always had a positive attitude until I found out that she had passed away from, her, you know, her husband had um, contacted me. And I think the reason why I would pick her is just the strength. Um, there's a lot of people in the world who exhibit a lot of strength, but they do it very quietly and they do it in the background. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a phrase, uh, a quote, you don't know how strong you are until, and then, you know, whoever has whatever illness, you know, until you have to fight, eh, whatever. And so um, that sticks out in my head as well. And ironically, you know, my mother and I have a, a, a bit of a love hate relationship. I left my home when I was 17. But in some ways, I would say that um, she is a hero to me because they immigrated from Taiwan in the 1960s. They had nothing between them, and she vowed that she was going to make a better life for her and her family and her daughters. Um, she grew up very poor. My grand, my dad grew up very rich. So they had huge differences in um, raising family ideas and money and importance of like in Taiwanese culture and Asian culture, you know, being a girl is not as highly regarded as being a boy. So she really taught us that girls could do anything that boys could do. <laughs> You know, that there's a phrase for that, right? Um, anything boys can do, girls can do better. And, and that's kind of like what she taught us, that there, there I could be anything. Um, and that's something that I carry all the time. People ask me, like, well, why do you think you, you have such confidence to do those things? It's because of my mother. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's an important, it's an important message. I have two daughters myself, so you know, learning how to uh, teach them um, you know, what's, what's important and how to, uh, how to realize that they can do anything, right. They have, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have their own unique sets of skills and strengths that, uh, that, you know, pretty much no man could ever bring to bear on a problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and it's a, it's a powerful thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's cool hearing that, uh, um, you know, a lot of times when we have people on the, on the show, they, they mention like, you know, authors or things like that. So it's cool to have someone who's like, my mom is my hero. And she really gave me the uh, the, the confidence stuff I need to move forward. Um, so what I want to, uh, what I want to talk about next is uh, your guiding principles, right? So guiding principles, the way I like to think about these is it's um, the top one or two like principles or maybe actions that you use on a regular basis, right? Every day to contribute to 
the success and influence that you enjoy today? Yeah, I would say be who you are. Um, I have been told so many different things. Like, you know, uh, I, I've been told that certain people don't like the way I dress. Some people say that they don't like it when I'm casual online. They, you know, like there's all sorts of things. And I really truly believe that the best way to be is just be yourself. And too often, I think we think we need to be a certain person for our spouse, for our kids, for our parents, for our friends. And what Lyme disease had taught me was, you know what? I am done being somebody else for somebody who doesn't even appreciate or doesn't even realize what I'm giving up in order to try to be this person for them. And <laughs> I became a little more boisterous at that time. And uh, I allowed myself yeah. to say no more often as well. You know, I used to be that person who everybody could go, oh, Vicki will do it. Vicki will do it. You know, that friend who would rearrange their schedule and, and whatever. And now, now I'm just like, you know what? Um, no. <laughs> And that's not in a mean way. It's it's just yeah. So it's 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 an important point for people to understand. One of the things that I remember um, learning a while back was that people don't care about you. I mean, they like people do care about you, but right. in their own head, the person they're thinking of is mm -hmm. themselves. Right. right. So I I ran an experiment a while back, a social experiment with my friends and family, where um, I was curious whether or not people actually like paid attention to what you wore because like I had all these clothes. Right. And I had like 65 shirts at one point. I was like, why am I doing this? Right. And it's like, cause you don't want people to see you in the same outfits all the time. Cause you know, what are they going to think of you? And the reality is they don't. Um, and so the social experiment I ran is like, like I picked an outfit for every person that I interacted with. I worked like at a company at the time and like anyone I was going to meet with, you know, the president, I wore a certain outfit. And like when I was going over to my family's house for dinner, I wore a certain outfit and it was just, you know, a pair of pants and a shirt or whatever I was wearing. And I went like six months where the, the, yeah. every person I interacted with, they only ever saw me in one outfit. Um, <laughs> and it took six months before one person noticed. That person was my stepdad, and he's like, do you own another shirt? And I was like, <laughs> yay, someone finally noticed. Um, and I was like, you know, I told him what the experiment was. And, and like since then, I've realized I don't, you don't really have to think about what other people are thinking about you because they're not. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. Um, and it's very freeing, right? Yeah. And like, like you mentioned, you can say, you know, I'm not going to rearrange my schedule because, you know, like mm -hmm. you are the most important person in, in, uh, in your life, right? You have to take care of yourself and love yourself because that's the foundation that you can actually make an impact in other people's lives is yeah. when you respect yourself and respect that spark of divinity in your life. So that basically wraps up our, our interview, but I got a couple more things I want to do. One of them I do on every show I call the uh, Heroes Challenge. The Hero Challenge is pretty simple, and it's just basically this. Do you have someone in your life that um, that's in your network that you think you could recommend to the show who has a good story, right? Someone whose entrepreneurial story is either fascinating or cool or something like that that you could recommend them on the show? Who are they, and why do you think they would be a good fit for the show? Oh, gosh. Um, yes, I have a few in mind. Did you want their names now? Just first name, just take my first name. We'll get the details later, but who are they? Why do you think they should come on the show? Yeah, um, well, the first one that comes to mind is June. She's also somewhat of a storyteller like me. Um, and she talks about healing your ancestral hurts. Um, the things that we pass on to our children without necessarily knowing that we're doing that. Um, I think she would be great. Um, another one is Adrian. She does, she actually put a some telesummit together called spiritual superheroes. Um, so that could be a really good one. Uh, a good fit. Yeah. 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 So um, thank you for that. We'll go ahead and reach out later for, uh, for connecting with, uh, with those people. Um, last thing is where can people find you if they are, um, if they're looking to get help telling their story, getting their book together and learning how to turn that into revenue on the backside, where can yeah. they find you and who is a good fit to reach out? 
Yeah, so um, they can find me virtually every social media platform there is out there. Just make sure you spell my name right. <laughs> my daughter's like, you're lucky you have a short name. I'm like, yeah, I have a short name, but one that people misspell all the time. There's an IE and an OU, you know. Um, so Facebook, I have a group called Write Your Biz Book, and it's B-I-Z. So Write Your Biz Book is the group. Um, we do lots of live streams and challenges um, on a regular basis in there to help with storytelling and help with book writing and help to get out of, you know, writer's block and to get the real truth about what it is to be a best-selling author, because I think that's really important these days that people understand what it really means for their business, that that book's not going to like just grow legs and go do something for them. They need a now what <laughs> kind of strategy afterwards. Um, I do have a freebie called Five Secret Strategies to Write Your Book Quickly, and it's at bit.ly slash five secret strategies. If maybe you can put that in the show notes, that would be great if you want to opt yeah, in. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Awesome. So you can reach out. And let me just uh, spell the name for people. It's V-I-C-K-I-E-G-O-U-L-D. Um, mm -hmm. So you, they can find you on social media and everything there. Um, thank yep. you so much for coming on the show, Vicki. Really appreciated having a conversation with you today. Um, yeah. I know storytelling is a the is a super it's a super powerful skill right and like we talked about it's a superpower so you can help people really learn their their stuff so if you're listening to the show and you're looking for someone to help you uh get up to get that book written and turn that into uh, uh into business on the other end mm -hmm. um reach out to vicky right Ch check out her facebook group i know uh, particularly facebook groups nowadays are great places to really learn a lot before yeah. you have to even invest anything because right. you can probably get in there and listen to the live screams and, the, and learn a lot. So anyways, thanks for coming on, Vicki. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was really fun.